So. Alhamdulillah, ladies and gentlemen. Now, this uh, earlier was the introduction without the Sheikh. Now is the introduction with the Sheikh. Alhamdulillah. And as I was saying earlier, in fact, uh, with the Sheikh himself, that uh, the last time we were together, in fact, in Abu Dhabi as the guest of the foreign minister there, and Al Umuri bima qasidiha. So every action is by intention and every man and woman will get what he or she intended. So I was just only pulling Shih Hamza's uh, leg, so to speak, when I <laughs> met you the last few months. I said, well, you must come to Malaysia and do something, actually. Uh, Alhamdulillah, ladies and gentlemen, he is here. So without further ado, indeed. This night of Layla to Jum'ah, Malam Jum'at, so we have this intellectual zikr tonight. Uh, Alhamdulillah, to replace our spiritual zikr there. Please, Shia Hamza. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Salamat batang. Apa khabar? That's the extent of my Malay. <laughs> Although I will say, uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, we took a Malay word from you via the English. Uh, in America, when people go crazy, they say, he ran amok. So amok is, yeah, amok, which is from ahmak, the Arabic. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala ahli wa sahbihi wa salam tasliman kathira wa la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah al-ali al-azim Allahumma la ilma lana illa ma alamtana innaka anta al-alim al-hakim Allahumma alimna ma yunfa'na wa yunfa'na bima alamtana wa zidna ilma wa salillahum ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala ahli wa sahbihi wa salam tasliman kathira wa la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah al-ali al-azim Alhamdulillah, I want to talk, inshallah, about uh, a, just a few things. One of them is the purpose of uh, human beings, uh, which is a metaphysical question. And then I also want to talk about the, how we're doing as human beings. And then finally, I want to talk about uh, what perhaps we should be doing as human beings. The first question uh, is what is the purpose of human beings? Uh, unfortunately, for the first time in human history, there are civilizations that do not really have any answer whatsoever to this question. This is actually unique in human history because human beings have always uh, had some reason for existence. Whereas the current dominant model in the Western civilization is really untenable metaphysically because the argument that you will find uh, amongst Western people is essentially what they would call, in their uh, term, an ex existentialist problem. In other words, that each person has to work out what the meaning of his life is for him or herself. That nobody's going to tell you what your life means. Uh, you simply have to work it out for yourself. And this is why suicide is actually a very serious option in that culture. We recently had, in, our, in my, the country I'm from, we had a very famous person commit suicide and there were actually articles arguing that this was his choice and people should be allowed to have this choice. Um, and, and you can't refute that argument unless you have a metaphysical argument to counter that argument. Um, Camus is a good example in the West. Uh, he was a, a French Algerian philosopher He's famous for a book called The Plague, The Myth of Sisyphus also. But he also eventually committed suicide. And so in essence, the, the philosophy, the dominant philosophy that is, uh, is in many, many parts of the world is actually a philosophy of nihilism. It's a philosophy of what the Arabs would term adamiya, that there's really no purpose to existence. If we look at our tradition, Most people, if you ask them, why, why are we here? Most Muslims would say, We only created humans and the spirit world to, for ibadah. And they would actually believe that this was essentially the purpose of our existence is ibadah. 
But there are other reasons that our scholars gave from the Qur'an for human existence. Because if somebody was not a conscious worshipper, then that would mean essentially that their purpose would be null and void. And this would mean that people outside of the faith, whatever the true faith would be at the time, uh, at one time it was the way of Moses, at another time the way of Jesus, uh, at another time perhaps the way of Buddha, if he was a prophet, as some uh, have argued. We have no uh, absolute evidence, but there are some that have made that argument uh, in the past. Uh, Isfarayini is one of them. Um, but if the, the final way, the prophetic way is the way of the Prophet Muhammad, then his way actually describes different reasons for the creation of human beings. In the Quran, one of them is isti'mar, that Allah created us from the earth, and then asta'marukum fiha, that He gave you isti'mar in the earth. And what that means is He asks that you do umran, that you actually build and cultivate the earth. This is called umran. And the Prophet ﷺ, he came as a prophet of the city, first and foremost. He's a prophet also of the Bedouin, he's a prophet of uh, the farmers, but first and foremost, he is a prophet of al Medina, the city. And the reason for that is because the last phase of human existence would be a, an urban phase, that people all over the world have increasingly flocked to cities. And the city is, uh, it's an ancient concept, but the modern city is a very new uh, concept. The idea of a megapolis, this massive uh, city which allows for anonymity, it allows for people to do things that they would not normally do uh, if they were in a small village where everybody knows who they are. So if you look now, the Prophet ﷺ came uh, to a city, al Medina. And he taught people how to live and behave uh, within that context. And then he also taught the Bedouin how to live and behave. And for that reason, one of the unique aspects of our fiqh, uh, the jurisprudence of Islam, is that it actually deals with people in isolation. It teaches you how to be, be even if you're one person living on a mountain, you can be a Muslim. Um, that uh, Robinson Crusoe, can be a Muslim whether or not Friday, Jumu'ah comes to the island. So uh, this is one of the interesting aspects of our religion, but primarily Islam is a collective religion. It's a religion of a group of people, an aggregate of people that are bound together in a millah or a jama'ah. And yet Allah ma'al jama'ah. Allah loves the group. He loves unity. Allah Himself is one. And He loves unity. He loves unity through diversity, just as His attributes are diverse. He's Rahman, but He's also Muntaqim. He's the Merciful, but He's also the Avenger of Wrongs. And these aren't contradictory, they're diverse attributes, but He is one. And in the same way, the Muslim civilization is diverse, but is essentially one. So if you go to Malaysia, there's a certain flavor to Islam here. Uh, your women wear colorful dresses. Muslim women have done that in the past. You go to other places and, and the Muslim women wear very plain uh, dresses. If you go to Nigeria, the women wear very colorful dresses. So this is, but the essence of the modesty is there. Whether it's colorful or whether it's black and white, it's, the essence is there. And this is the beauty of the Islamic tradition, is that it has this diversity. So one of the reasons is isti'mar is actually to cultivate the earth through Umran, which is the term that Ibn Khaldun in his great work al Muqaddimah uses for civilization. One of the signs of the end of time is the Prophet ﷺ said, there would be kharab al-Umran wa Umran al-Kharab, the destruction of civilization and the civilization of destruction. The civilization of destruction. In other words, a nihilistic civilization that tears down to build up. This is called the Hegelian dialectic. A tadmir li ta'mir. Destroy and tear down to rebuild, to build up. And this is one of the phenomena that we see around the world. Wars come in, they destroy everything, and then people make a lot of money rebuilding those places. The real Umran is cultivation. The Prophet ﷺ was not a revolutionary in, in that sense of the word that he turned everything upside down. 
In fact, the Quran says, "In the muluk, if they enter a city, they abjure it and make it a prison for their inhabitants." The Saba, the queen of Bilqis, says that that kings, when they enter into cities, they turn everything upside down. They make the high people low. They make the low people high. And Allah confirms that. Well, kadarikum yafanun, like that they do. So Allah actually confirmed what this woman said in the Quran. The Prophet, when he went into Mecca. He said, "Man dakhla bayta Abi Sufyan kana amina." He took the the Aziz of the Quraysh and he held him in that position. When he took the keys of the Kaaba and the Abdar family, Banu Abdar, these were the uh, the Abdul Dar people. And uh, Talha ibn Amr came to him and asked for the keys. Allah commanded him and to adul amanati ila ahliha. Give the keys back to the people. Who have the the sacred trust, and he gave the keys back to Talha, and he said, "No one will take these keys until the end of time." This is how the man became Muslim. So the Prophet did not turn everything upside down in Mecca. He purified. He he made tahdib. He said, "Inna mabu'itu li utami ma makarim al akhlaq." I was sent to restore, to complete. The good character of the Arabs. The Arabs had good character. They they weren't. Islam did not come into an ethical vacuum. It actually came into a society that had very very high qualities. And this is very important uh, to remember that Islam cannot function in an ethical vacuum. In the same way that it cannot function where there's mercy is absent in the hearts of people. When the Prophet kissed one of his grandchildren, one of the Bedouin desert Arabs. Said at the Qabrul Aulad, you kiss children. He said, I have ten children and I've never kissed one of them. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Do I have anything in my religion for somebody who has no mercy in his heart? In other words, if you're a cruel person, this religion has nothing for you. It has nothing for you because it's a it's a religion based on rahma. It's a religion based on mahabba, and and those things are the things that unite people. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam told us that Allah shakka ismu ism al-rahm min ismu min ismih al-rahman that He derived the womb from His name, the Rahman, and this is why kinship bonds bind us. First and foremost, as Banu Adam, kulukum min Adam wa Hawa, kulukum min Adam wa Adam min Turab. All of you are from Adam, and Adam is from Turab. He's from dust. So outwardly, we are all the same. There is no superiority of one group over another group. I'll get to that. So this is istimad is very important. This is why anybody that is cultivating the earth, that's doing something beneficial, is fulfilling a divine function. He has a purpose in life, whether he's worshiping or not. The second reason is istikhlaf. Now istikhlaf has. A couple of different meanings, but one of them is this. Is I'm taking this from uh, the great ethicist Raghab Isfahani. He was also a professor of Quran, one of the teachers through books of Imam Al Ghazali. Raghab Isfahani in Dariyah Ila Makarim Sharia says that the second reason that Allah created human beings was for istikhlaf, that they actually are replacements. For the previous generation, so as a new generation comes, they replace the previous generation. When you look at your children, you're seeing your replacements. They're going to take your place one day because you will die, and they will take that, fulfill that function that you were fulfilling before. That's one of the meanings. Another meaning is to act as a steward. Inni jaidun fil ardi khalifa. I'm placing in the earth a caliph. So Allah gives us these tools. He gives us the means that we need to fulfill this function to be khulafa in the earth. And when Dawood was told that he was being made a caliph, he, Allah told him to to judge with justice and not follow his hawa, because this is what will divert you from justice. So this is the second purpose that we are created. The third purpose that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala created us. Is that we are here to adore Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, to know Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, to know our Creator. Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, when He said that Ma Kharaktu Insa Al Al Jinna Wal Insa Illa Li Abunur, I only created the sprites and the, uh, the the spirits and the humans to worship. Ibn Abbas said Li Arifun, in order to know Me. 
So the ibadah comes out of knowledge. You have to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, the way that we know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala according to our ulama is through the aql. It's actually through the intellect. It's not through naql, which is revelation. The way that we know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, fa'lam annahu la ilaha illallah. No, have ilm that there is no God except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the ulama derive different per, uh, proofs for this. Burhan al tamanu Burhan al tawarid for people that have studied some aqidah, they know these, these proofs. They, they looked at different proofs. The intellect can arrive at an understanding through thought that you have to have a creator. Nothing can come out of uh, nothing. You cannot get something from nothing. There has to be a source behind this. If you look now, for the first time in human history, we have scientists that are denying design. They say that it's only a trick in the mind that you have been designed. And yet, we can clearly see the design of our bodies. People that say, well, you just don't understand natural selection. You don't understand the mechanisms of evolution that would enable you to uh, to, uh, to reach this level of complexity without a God. Which my 15 year old was studying biology and his teacher was an atheist. And he came and told me that he was, he was studying biology and, and he said that his teacher said that we can explain life without God. And I said that, that biologists should not interfere with cosmology. A biologist should stay in biology and not start talking about cosmology, because that's another science, cosmology. And it reminded me of the, the joke about the biologists that meet God, and God asked them what they're up to, and they said, well, we've gotten rid of you. And, and, and God asked the biologist, how did you get rid of me? And they said, well, we can explain how we got here without you. And he said, well, how would you do that? He said, well, first we take some cosmic dust. And God says, no, 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 wait a second. Get your own dust. Right? You see, because where, where did it all start? Where did we come from? Even if evolution explained how we have evolved as a species, it doesn't explain where the original material came from. Man cannot bring anything into existence from nothing. He makes organs from already existing cells. The cloning comes from already existing cells. He's now in stem cell research and doing all of these things. Everything that he makes has pre-existing materials. We cannot make anything out of, out of uh, nothing. It's impossible for humans to do that because nothing comes from nothing. And this is why my own teacher said, كَذَبَ mulhidun. The atheists are liars. Al-admu la yujid al-wujud. Non-existence cannot bring existence. Al-fawda la yukawin al-nidam. Anarchy or chaos cannot bring order into existence. Al-jahilu la yalid al-ilm. Ignorance cannot bring knowledge into existence. And then he said, إِنَّ مَا هِيَ إِنْتِكَاسُ عَقْلِيٍّ كَمَنْ يَمْشِي عَلَى رَأْسِهِ وَرِجْلَاهُ فِي الْهَوَىٰ This is the inversion, this is an intellectual inversion of reality, like somebody who's walking on his head and his feet are in the air. That this is something that humans have never believed. And, and this argument now of the modern atheists, the, the, this is an ancient argument. Atheists have always been around. In fact, atheists were actually more sophisticated a hundred years ago than they are today. And this is the truth, because a hundred years ago they were well versed in philology, like Nietzsche. They were well versed in, they were, uh, they were profound philosophers. Even at the time of Socrates, there were atheists. People forget that Marx, who was, a, who was an atheist, he did his, uh, his PhD dissertation was on the materialists, the Greek materialists. So he had studied materialistic philosophy. So this argument, this modern argument is not a new argument. It's, it's a very old argument. And our scholars dealt with this argument extensively, but people don't read their books anymore. And one of the simplistic views of some of these modern Muslims that deny theology and the tradition of theology, they have no response to these new atheists. They have no response other than to say kuffar. 
But this is not enough because Muslims have always dealt with these things intellectually in a, in a, in a, in a tradition called the Radd al-Shubuhat, which is refutation of, of the obfuscations that are brought out by the atheists. So it's important for us uh, to remember that, that we were created to adore Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but to know Him through ma'rifah, and this is through the in intellect, first and foremost. And our intellect is a spiritual concept. The intellect is immaterial, it's not of this world. And this is why we don't know where we go when we dream, but we know that we leave this place and we enter into another realm because we're in a realm that's immaterial. So this is important for us to remember that now as, as our young people are, are exposed to a lot of these ideas, we need to address these ideas in sophisticated ways. We, we, if we don't have trained uh, intellects that can address these problems metaphysically. The second uh, thing that I wanted to talk about, so in terms of our tradition, the, the human purpose is cultivation of the earth, which is also uh, true civilization, not a pseudo-civilization, not the civilization of monetization, to use a word that is very popular in corporations, of how we monetize everything. Muslims did not monetize everything. There were things that Muslims actually did for altruistic purposes. Now the dominant belief, if you believe in evolution, you believe in the selfish gene. That everything a human being does is for his selfish nature. That people are not altruistic. This is not true. This is a lie. This is one of the lies that they teach. Human beings have a dual nature. We're nafis and we're munafis. We are precious. But we're also, and munafis, we relieve people of their troubles, but we're also munafis, we're competitive by nature. All of this is taken from the same root of the soul. So the human soul has munafisa, it has com competition, it has tanfis, it has relieving the sufferings of others and helping others, and it has nafasa, it has preciousness. This is the human nature. Allah has made us a hybrid creature. We have three components. We have the Quwa Shahwaniya, Quwa Al-Ghadabiya, and the Quwa Al-Aqliya. This is what Allah, and Imam Al-Ghazali adds a, a fourth, and he's unique in human history as far as I can tell for, for uh, departing from that traditional model. He added the, the, the just, the Quwa Adriya or balance, that balance was a necessary faculty of the soul. These three faculties, if you look at the appetites, human appetites, the human appetite is insatiable. The Prophet ﷺ said that if the son of Adam had a, uh, a valley of, of gold, min dhahabin, la ahabba wadiyan akhar, or la ahabba an yakuna lahu wadiyani. He would want two mountain, two valleys of gold. And he said, len yam la fahu illa turab, or illa turab al qabri. The only thing that will fulfill the, will fill the mouth of the son of Adam is the dust of his grave. That's what will fulfill. So the appetites are endless. And that's why people that pursue the appetites will literally destroy themselves through that pursuit. And they will degrade themselves because they will take their hawa, their appetite as a god beside Allah, and it will take them to utter despair. And this happens many, many people. The second aspect of the human being is the ghadabiya, which is the irascible nature. Human beings have an irascible nature. This is put there for a purpose. Just like the appetites are put there to preserve us, we have an appetite for food and drink, which preserves our bodies, and also for sexuality, which preserves our species. But these can be perverted, and they can go into perversions that lead to overeating or sexual incontinence, where people uh, begin to do things that are harmful, that cause diseases to be brought upon themselves. And then the irascible nature, this quwa ghadabiyya, which is where anger comes from. This is there to protect us from harm, to ward off harm. And, and, and this is an important quality. And then he's given us a rational, the aqliya. And this should be the ruler. 
This should rule. But what's happened on our planet is the appetites and the anger have ruled. And this is what the Prophet said, Dabba ilaykum da'ul umam. The, 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 the disease of civilizations will creep into you. That envy, the appetite for more, and baghda, hatred which comes out of this other, these will creep into you. And then he said, And hatred is a destructive force. And he said, it, it, it literally shaves everything. And he said, I don't say that it shaves hair. It shaves the religion. It will remove your religion, this hatred. And you can see this now in amongst Muslims where this disease has entered into their hearts. They no longer have mercy. They no longer have compassion. They take uh, innocent people and, and, and chop their heads off out of this anger. And then they say, well, this is what they do it to us. Well, they're not our teachers. They're not our teachers. No matter what they do to us, we don't do what goes against our Prophet Musa. Don't be like those who harmed Musa. In other words, don't harm the Prophet Muhammad by besmirching his good name, by attributing deeds that are not from his religion to his religion. Don't disperse, besmirch the name of the Prophet Muhammad He was sent as a mercy to all the worlds. He was sent as a mercy. He wasn't sent as a terror. He was sent as a mercy to all the world. And these people misquote the Quran. The Prophet ﷺ said, at the end of time there would be young men. He said, Hudatha al Asnan. They're young in age. Sufaha al Ahlam. They have empty intellects. La yatajawuz al Iman hanajiruhum. Iman will not go past their throats. And in a riwayah, يَقْرَؤُونَ الْقُرَانَ وَلَا يَتَجَاوُزُ حَنَاجِرُهُمْ They will read the Qur'an, but it won't go beyond their throats. In other words, they won't understand it. يَقُولُونَ مِنْ خَيْرِ قَوْلِ الْبَرِيَةِ They will speak from the words of the best of creation. وَيَمْرُقُونَ مِنْ الْإِسْلَامِ كَمَا يَمْرُقُ الرَّمْيُ سَهْمٌ مِنْ رَمْيِ They will... They will be shot out of Islam just like an arrow is shot from its bow. And he said in a, in a Sahih riwayah, he said, whoever can kill them, let him kill them. Because in killing them is a reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the situation that we find ourselves in. Everywhere there's fitan. The Prophet said, Satakunu ahdath wa fitanun. There will be events, momentous events. There will be tribulations and civil strife. There will be sectarianism. There will be differences. And he said, فَإِن كَانَ كَذَارِكَ إِنْ اسْتَطَعْتَ أَنْ تَكُونَ الْمَقْتُولَ لَلْقَاتِلْ فَفَعَلْ If you're able to be the one being killed instead of the one killing, then do that. In fitna, what is the point? What is the madness, all this madness that's going on? Human beings that have lived for centuries together, suddenly they're being driven from their homes. Look at all the people fleeing. And you're lucky. In, 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 and we believe in luck. Hadd is, 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 is a blessing. Because hav, God gives it to whom He pleases. Health is something that God gives to some and deprives others. You are very fortunate in Malaysia because you have been blessed with relative security. Nothing is secure in this dunya. Do you feel so secure that God won't open the earth and swallow you up? And we know about sinkholes now, which is a sign of the end of time. The Prophet said that there will be sinkholes swallowing people up. So you shouldn't feel so secure. But you have relative security. This is a blessing. The way you protect the blessing is obedience. If you're outside of obedience, you lose your blessings. Malaysia has, you have the blessing of a uniformity of faith. I just came from Turkey. It's one of the few countries where you go into masjids and they pray the same way. It's a great blessing to have uniformity of faith. This is the way that they used to be in North African countries. When I first went 30 years ago, people prayed the same way. Now that everybody prays different ways. Because all these different uh, factions and ideologies have come in. And people read the hadith directly and they think they can derive the hadith just by, Oh, I follow Quran and Sunnah, brother. 
As if Imam Shafi'i didn't follow the Quran and Sunnah. Did you go and study 17 years? Did you go and study 17 years the Arabic language to follow the Quran and Sunnah like Imam Shafi'i? Imam Shafi'i went 17 years. He was amassing, he was one of the greatest scholars of the Arabic language. That's why he was able to write his great book in Usul al Fiqh, because Usul al Fiqh is based on language, it's based on understanding the nuances of language, on what the ba is. In, 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 in wiping your head, biru'usikum, what is that ba? What type of ba is that? Is it tab'id? Is it, is it for ziyadah? What is it? This is the debates of the fuqaha. There are many hadiths, you have to know what min means. There are many types of min in the Qur'an. وَنُنَزِرُ min al Qur'an. That's min al-bayan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Prophet ﷺ said, مَنْ صَامَ رَمَضَانُ وَاتْبَعُهُ سِتًا مِنْ شَوَال the Shafi'i said that's min from the tab'id. In other words, six days of shawal. Imam Malik said, no, it's min al-ibtida. It's the, it's the initiative min. In other words, it means beginning in shawal, you can do it in any other month before the next Ramadan comes. These are valid khilafat. But who knows these things now? Who studies in Mughni al-Labib of Ibn Hisham and masters that book before they can talk about this? In the hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Hind, in the Sahih collection, Hind comes to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and says to the Prophet that Abu Sufyan withholds money from me. And the Prophet said, خُذِ مِنْ مَالِهِ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ Take from his money uh, in what's uh, the, the norm of your people. In other words, for your socioeconomic class, take the money that you need, and, and that means without his knowledge. The ulama differ on that. Some said he was, because any hadith, the Prophet is acting as a qadi, as a judge, or he's acting as a mufti, giving a legal position, or he's acting as a hakim, as a, a ruler, or he's acting as a muballagh, just giving, or he's acting as nasih, he's giving wow. These are determined through usul al-fiqh. And the Usuri scholars differ about these things. Now every ignoramus, every Tom, Dick and Abdullah picks up the, the Qur'an and picks up the hadith and they say, Hum rijal wa nahnu rijal, they're men and we're men, we follow the book and the sunnah, as if Malik didn't follow the book and the sunnah. Imam Shafi'i said, إِذَا ذُكُرَ الْعُلَمَا فَمَالِكُ النَّجْمِ If you mention the ulama, Malik's the star. The Prophet predicted Imam Malik, Abu Hanifa, and Imam Shafi'i, and على رواية Imam Ahmed, all of them were mentioned by Ishara in, in the Hadith literature. Our ulama agreed on these four. The Sunni scholars agreed on these four. Without synods, without councils, nothing. Our Qur'an is one book. We have no other book. When you heard this Qari reciting, he learned the seven Qira'at. If you go to Morocco, they recite with Riwayat Warsh, an Nafi'. If you go to Libya, they recite with Qalun, an Nafi'. If you go to Iran, they recite Hafs an Asim. If you go to Malaysia, Hafs an Asim. They're all sound riwayat. How did they all agree on these? Because of Isnad. All of them came from the same source. No other religion has a unified book. No other religion. The Christians differ on the Bible. The Jews differ on their Bible. The Buddhists differ on their, uh, uh, their scriptures. The Hindus differ on their scriptures. No tradition except Islam has a unified scripture. Not only that, we recite it the same way. If you're in Malaysia, you learn the Makharij al Huruf are the same as they are in uh, America. If I teach Makharij al Huruf, the Huruf al Halq are the same ones. You teach the same ones. Huruf al Jawf are the same ones. Huruf al Lisan. Huruf, all of them are the same. The Khishum, it's the same. How is that possible? How? Because all of them came from the same source. No other religion has the unity of this religion. If you go to Mecca and Medina, and you go into the masjid, at maghrib time, you will have an ibadi next to you, you will have a shi'i next to you, you will have a hanafi, a maliki, a shafi'i, you will have a zaydi, all of these different groups, and yet they all pray three rakats, they stand, they go into ruku'a, they stand back up, they go into sajda, some of them might move their finger, some of them might keep it flat, some of them might put their hands here, some might put it here, some might put it here, but the prayer is the same, no other religion has that uniformity. And there are people that are coming into your country that are starting to confuse your people about your religion. You have a good, solid foundation. 
The people, the people that spread Islam in this country, they knew Islam. If they didn't know Islam, you would have never accepted Islam. And the thing about a lot of these modern people, people flee from them. You look at all the people fleeing from the cities in Iraq. When they come into town, people run away. And Allah says in the Quran, فَبِمَا رَحْمَةٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ لِنْتَ لَهُمْ It's a mercy from Allah that you were gentle with them. وَلَوْ كُنْتَ فَضًّا غَلِيدَ الْقَلْبِ لَنْ فَضُّ مِنْ حَوْلِكَ And if you were harsh and hard-hearted, they would have fled from around you. And this is a proof that these people have nothing to do with the way of the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. Nothing at all. Nothing whatsoever to do. Because his way is a way that brings people in. It unites people. It makes ta'leef. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala anfaqta ma fil ardi ma alafta bayna qulubihim walakinna Allah alafa bayna qulubihim Allah will unite the hearts if you follow the Prophet فَلْيَحْذِرِ الَّذِينِ يُخَالِفُونَ عَنْ أَمْرِهِ But woe unto you if you go against his way if you go against his way أَنْ تُصِيبْهُمْ فِتْنَةٌ They will be afflicted with a fitna a, a, a horrible tribulation or a painful chastisement. And his way is the way of the of Ahlul Ilm, the Salaf al Salih, not how people interpret it today. No. The Prophet, his ulama were rightly guided. He said, يَحْمِلُ هَذَا الْعِلْمِ مِنْ كُلِّ خَلَفٍ عُدُولُهُ يَنْفُونَ عَنْهُ تَحْرِيفَ الْغَالِينَ وَانْتِحَالَ الْمُبْطِلِينَ this religion is carried in each generation by just and upright people. They will negate, they will negate the extremists, and they will negate the decontextualizers, the people that take his religion out of context, and they will negate the, the, uh, the interpretations of the ignorant ones. Those Udul are the people of Senad, the people that took from the people that took from the people that took back to the Prophet ﷺ. This is our tradition. And this is the tradition that was in Malaysia. And so I'm warning you as people. I am warning you. I am a warner. And I'm telling you because the Prophet is Bashir and Nadir. And his people should be people of Bishara and people of Nadara. They should give good news. But they should also warn people. If you allow these seditious teachings into this country, you will see factionalism, you will see sectarianism, you will see your houses divided, you will see religion become a source of fitna and tribulation. You are Shafi. This is your tradition. Your aqidah is a sound aqidah. And you believe in tazkiyah. This is your tradition. Hold to your tradition and don't let people pervert your tradition. And all traditions need reassessing. This is the job of the scholars. You have to reassess things, always. There's tajdeed. You need renovation. Things get in that maybe should not be in. That's true. All that is true. But don't let that be an excuse to throw the baby out with the bathwater. No. Don't let that be an excuse. This is my warning to you because you're, the people of Malaysia are good people generally. Everybody has bad people and all of us have some some uh, bad qualities in us, but generally, the, I've been here three times, I'm amazed at the kindness of your people. I'm amazed at their thoughtfulness. I'm amazed at your adab. I'm amazed at your gentleness. Wallahi, I'm telling you the truth. I'm, and you still have smiles on your face despite what's happening in the world. You hold on to what you have. Hold on to the love in your hearts. This religion is about loving each other. إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ إِخْوَةً the, the, the mu'mins are brothers and sisters. We're in solidarity. And anyone that wants to sow division and strife, be reminded of what Imam Ali said. Al-jama'atu ma'al safwa ma'al kudura khayrun min al-furqa ma'al safwa. That the group with its impurities is better than the sect or sectarianism with its purity. Did you hear that? The group with its impurities is better than sectarianism with its purity. So woe unto those people that tell you that we're following uh, the, the, uh, the Firqa Najiyah, that we're the only people that are rightly guided, all these people are astray. No. These are Muslims. They say, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. They deserve dignity. They deserve their honor. Some of them are astray. Khalatu Amran, Sayyan. Uh, 
They, they mix good and bad, that's true. Allah says, ثُمَّ أَوْرَثْنَ الْكِتَابَ الَّذِينَ فَفَيْنَ مِنْ عِبَادِنَا We have given this book to those we have chosen from our people, from our servants. فَمِنْهُمْ Amongst them, ظَالِمٌ لِنَفْسِهِ He's wronging himself. He's still Mustafa. Allah astafahu. He's still from the chosen. مِنْهُمْ ظَالِمٌ لِنَفْسِهِ وَمِنْهُمْ مُقْتَصِدٌ وَمِنْهُمْ سَابِقٌ بِالْخَيْرَاتِ بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ And amongst them are the outstrippers. All of them are from this ummah. And we should love all of them. And care about all of them. And have rahmah in our hearts for them. And want to see them make tawbah. And now in conclusion, tawbah. If you look at this planet, everywhere you look, we have strife. Everywhere you look, we're seeing environmental degradation. You're a fish people. You, you, historically, Malaysia has, has lived on fish. We've lost 80 to 90 percent of the fish in the oceans that people eat. 80 to 90 percent. The fish have been completely depleted from the ocean. There's a, a, the foremost expert on jellyfish lives nearby in New Zealand, nearby relative to where I'm from. She did her PhD at UC Berkeley and she wrote a book called Bloom about the jellyfish that are taking over the ocean. The jellyfish are now taking over the oceans. Jellyfish are spineless, mindless, they have no brain and they have no spinal cords, and, and they're consumers. They just eat plankton. They're taking over the ocean because this is the ocean is metaphysically representative of human consciousness. And this is what's happened to the human being. We have become spineless, mindless consumers like jellyfish. We're like jellyfish. And just as the jellyfish are taking over the oceans, the spineless, mindless consumption is taking over the ocean of consciousness. People now without thinking, they consume they don't think about future generations. All of, this, all of this that's happening on the planet, it can't go on. You cannot keep producing the garbage that you're producing. We cannot keep consuming at the levels we're consuming. If people consume at the level of the average American around the globe, we will need three Earths to supply all the goods. We represent 5% of the population. We consume over 20% of the world's natural resources. We are Mubadhirin. And Allah says, Innan Mubadhirina kanu ikhwana shayateen. That those who are extravagant are like brethren to the demons. They're like brethren to the demons. We should be turning away from this. Fortunately, we have people in the United States that are, are speaking out against this consciously. We have people that are now, where I come from, we have people that are downsizing, that are going to small houses, that are getting off the grid. We have people going back to simple farming techniques because they realize this is untenable. It can't continue on, but they're not enough. And this is why you here in Malaysia, you have to think, all of this affects all of us. We're a global community. The part and the whole cannot be separate anymore. And those that are polluting in one place, the pollution is affecting others in other places. We have now, radiation has affected us. We know that the Fukuyama, what happened in Japan, it's affected us. The radiation is, it, levels have increased. There's a massive, the size of Texas, there's a garbage pit in the middle of the Pacific Ocean between you and my country. Is a massive garbage pit the size of Texas. This is what we're doing to the planet. Allah says, ذَهَرَ الْفَسَادُ فِي الْبَرِّ وَالْبَحْرِ بِمَا كَسَبَتْ أَيْدَ النَّاسِ لِيُذِيقُهُمْ بَعْضَ الَّذِي عَمِلُوا لَعَلَّهُمْ يَرْجِعُونَ And this is in Surah Al-Rum, in the, in the chapter called the Europeans, that corruption has manifest on the land and in the ocean because of what humans are doing with their own hands. And Allah allows that to happen لِيُذِيقُهُمْ in order to let them taste the harm of what they were doing that perhaps they might make tawbah, that perhaps they might turn to God. We have problems all over the planet, we need a global tawbah. 
We need people to turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We need people to understand we cannot continue. We have children. I have children. I think about my children's future. I think about the world that they're going to inherit. But not just my children. I think about children all over the world. I travel all over the world and I see education levels in Africa are abysmal. Education levels in Ferguson, America, in, in Missouri are abysmal. That there are, there are people that are neglected simply because of the color of their skin. There are people that are neglected because they don't have that socioeconomic status. These things are wrong. And we need to work as a community. The Muslims should be shuhada ala nas. We should be the witnesses unto humanity. We should be the ones showing the world. That's what the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, kuntum khayra ummatan ukhrijat lin nas. You are the best ummah that came out for humanity, not for yourselves. He didn't say kuntum khayra ummatan ukhrijat li anfusikum. He said lin nas, for humanity. Why? Because you enjoin what's right, you forbid what's wrong, you condemn vice when you see it, and you believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the function of our community. We should be condemning what's wrong. We should be encouraging what's right. But the Prophet ﷺ warned us, he said, مَا أَنْتُمْ إِذَا مَرَجَ الدِّينُكُمْ وَصُفِكَ الدِّمَا وَظَهَرَ تَزِينَ وَشَرَفُ الْبُنْيَانِ He said, what are you? He used ma. He didn't even say man, who are you? He said, what are you? If your religion becomes confused and you start shedding blood, and you, you're luxurious, and you manifest all your luxury, and your buildings become exceedingly tall. What are you? Ma antum? Are you fulfilling your purpose? This planet needs global toba. There was a time in my country, in the United States, where the presidents used to tell people when they had difficulties to fast. They had days of fasting that were actually national days of fasting in the 19th century, where they told everybody to fast and to ask God forgiveness. This is the United States of America. It's no longer a Christian country. We don't even know what it is. I don't know what's happened to my country. All I noticed when I was a kid, Nobody had tattoos. Now everybody has tattoos. When I was a kid, everybody got married. Now, people don't get married other than uh, homosexuals. Like, <laughs> nobody gets married. The only people that want to get married are the people that used to not want to get married. Uh, Annie Leibovitz, a uh, brilliant writer from New York, Annie Leibovitz, was asked about that. She's a lesbian. She was asked about it. She said, when I was young, that's why you were a lesbian, so you didn't have to get married. And she said, or you said you were a homosexual just to get out of the army. He said, now that's what everybody wants to do. So I don't know what's happened to my country. It's changed a lot. And you're going to get the same diseases in this country. You will get the same thing if you allow these things in without thinking about what you have. Your families will break down. You'll start building old folks' homes. Instead of taking care of your parents, you'll just put them in to let a caretaker take care of them. This is already happening in some Muslim countries. This is what happens because the Western civilization is a package deal. Don't think you could just take part of it. Uh, Arnold Toynbee said, it doesn't work like that. You get the whole thing. And that's why you, you, you're a creative people. You need to be more creative. Really, you need to be more creative. You need to think about Malaysia being a model country. You're one of the best Muslim countries. There, there's a few Muslim countries on this earth that, that I go to and I, I think, Alhamdulillah, there's, there's some Muslims that are actually normal and they're functioning. And Malaysia is one of them. And may Allah bless you and keep that. Wallahi, may Allah bless you and keep that. So, Imam an in his in his famous book, called uh, Riyad al-Sariheen. He has an introduction. The first bab is ikhlas. That's the first chapter, is sincerity. We need sincerity. But the second chapter is tawbah. We need a sincere tawbah. Tubu ilallahi jami'an. You know, turn all of you together back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet said, Astaghfiru rabbukum fi'ni astaghfiru Allah sab'ina marra. Ask forgiveness of your Lord because I ask forgiveness every day at least 70 times. The Prophet who, who was sinless, he had no sin and yet he's asking forgiveness of our Lord. We need to ask forgiveness of Allah. The Prophet ﷺ told us he gave all the diseases of the world in his final address. 
He said that the blood of Jahiliyyah is over. There's no more revenge in my religion. And he said the first blood he put down was Rabi'a ibn al-Harith ibn Abd al-Muttalib, his own family. So if anybody was going to take vengeance, it would have been his family. He said no. And then he said, so this Jahili hatred, it, it has to end. And in our tradition, we have the ability, and uh, Dr. Al-Afifi, who's one of your muftis here, will confirm this. The Prophet ﷺ said that it was permitted for a Muslim to give security to anybody. He can give security to people. But these people don't know the sunnah of the Prophet. If we give security, then they're supposed to honor that and let those people go. They don't do that anymore because they don't know the sunnah. This woman who went on, uh, telev on YouTube to speak to these people that are holding her son hostage, she had a better understanding of Islam as a non-Muslim than these people in, uh, in Iraq have. She said, I studied your religion and your religion says that one soul is not held to account for what other souls do. And she said, my son's not responsible for what American foreign policy does. And then she said, and then I read that your Prophet Muhammad, he had amnesty and he, and he forgave people. So I'm asking for my son back. She said, I just want to hug him. Now, that's one woman. And I know that Muslims have untold suffering. I know that. If you look at what's happened to the Iraqi Muslims at the hands of, of, of these people, it's worse than all of the, the, the Christians. But they only talk about the Christians. I'm aware of that. I'm very aware of that. And it should all stop. But for me, the most important thing in this religion is the preservation of the honor of our Prophet ﷺ. When we harm each other, that's what we do amongst ourselves. But when we harm peoples from other religions and other cultures, it harms our religion. It harms our religion. And that's why it's so odious to me. All of it is bad. What the Jews in Israel have done to the Palestinians is, is heinous and condemnable. It's heinous and condemnable. But what Muslims who claim to be Muslims are doing to people in these places is, to me, more heinous. Because when an Israeli attacks a Muslim, it doesn't affect the religion of Islam. But when these people attack innocent people, it makes our Prophet people think that his religion was a cruel religion. And I want to end with a quote by Amir Abdul Qadir al Jazairi, one of the great Muslims of the 19th century who died in 1883. He said, when we think how few men of real religion there are, how small the numbers of defenders and champions of the truth, when one sees ignorant persons imagining that the principles of Islam are hardness, severity, extravagance, and barbarity, it is time to repeat these words. Sabrun jameel, wallah musta'an. Beautiful patience, and our help is with God. Jazakumullah khairan, wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Ladies and gentlemen, mashallah, I'm into that. Um, I hope by now, uh, if you didn't believe me, I think, uh, I'm, I hope that I'm justified in giving the title to Sheikh Hamza Al-Khatib Al-Amriki here. Yeah. And if you wanted to travel back in time and see how the famous Al-Khatib Al-Baghdadi gave a speech, mashallah, this is our Khatib Al-Baghdadi of today, alhamdulillah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you indeed, Ya Sheikh. And indeed, may we all indeed turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for guidance and indeed in our repentance uh, in tawbah to him indeed uh, from listening to him just now. Now, um, I understand that than age, mashallah, you can actually ask questions. Uh, they will be taking questions. Give the law there. Oh, thank you. This is the iPad for which the questions are coming in through the internet uh, from Facebook and, and, and Twitter. And uh, just one of the things that I, I'm, you know, that I remember, in fact, meeting Sheikh Hamza for the very first time back in the, in the 90s in Fez in, in, in Morocco. And that was the first time that I heard about uh, the Sheikh. And uh, I was amazed when I was studying there to see, wow, here we have an American alim, ulama, the sheikh, who 
brought about 200 students from the West to study in a pondo in, 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 in Morocco in the, at the Qarawiyin. And I thought, subhanAllah, it, 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 it was an eye-opener for me, mashallah. And uh, one of the people who, whom I met actually uh, back uh, then was uh, Sister Uzma, who is one of the sisters who, you know, who's behind the, you know, these, uh, this organization and helping out to uh, you know, do all the internet stuff and getting all the questions there. So it's taqdeer of Allah that here in this proper welcoming majlis of you, Ya Sheikh, that uh, Uzma is with us here today and I really won't, will never, never forget that. MashaAllah, and please do send my salams and regards to her there. So, so some of us, you know, we were studying there in Morocco and these, the American, Canadian and British quote-unquote tourists come students needed help to make sure that when they go to the souk they don't get <laughs> cheated and so on and so forth. But uh, maybe if I can start, I think, um, before I start reading these other questions coming from the internet. Um, of course, I, you know, remembering myself, he actually, in, the, in fact, that event uh, in, in Fez, just the thought that here, wow, we have people coming from the West going to a Muslim land, wanting to study in, in a pondo, essentially, in a madrasa, to do traditional Islamic education. Um, now, how relevant is that? Now, I can say this uh, with Shay Hamza as well, because Shay Hamza is a good example of a Muslim who, when he became Muslim, mashallah, back uh, in the 70s, he actually went to the Muslim world to study with the ulama, to study with the masters, to study with those who really understand Islam. And that meant for him, you know, to, to go to the Muslim world. Um, to find a pondo, you see, and now maybe in our country we're busy, I hope not, uh, trying to close down our pondos when people like Mashallah Shia Hamza are trying to find all the very best pondos in the Muslim world to, 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 to study with the top gurus there. So, Sheikh, um, uh, why is this important? You know, why, why, why is traditional education still important in, in today's age there? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Well, first of all, the, you know, I, I, I went to traditional madrasa, I had teachers um, mostly out on the Mauritanian, the Moroccan, and Algerian tradition. Most of my teachers were, f were from these, although I did have Azhari teachers when I was in the Emirates studying. But what I found is that, and Mauritania still has a very strong uh, traditional uh, uh, Torah heritage. Um, but I, I have my criticisms also, um, so I, I don't think, I think the madrasa system um, in, in some ways ossified and, was, and, and, and stopped uh, bringing about creative solutions to a lot of the problems, which is why I think so many traditional scholars have been marginalized, because they're, they're not able to really understand the time they're living in. Um, and, and, and so I do have my criticisms, but, I, but nonetheless, you can't throw the baby out with the bathwater, as we say, it's an English saying, but you know, it means that just because you have problems, it doesn't mean if, if the house is dilapidated, but the structure is still good, you don't tear it down, you renovate it, and this is tajdeed. So I think our tradition needs tajdeed, but, and my own teacher, Sheikh Abdullah bin Beya, who Dr. Al-Afifi is very familiar with, Sheikh Abdullah has been uh, working on tajdeed usul al-fiqh um, very, very fervently and, and really trying to restore the maqasidi tradition, a true maqasidi tradition, not, not using the maqasid to, to, uh, to basically do away with the, the sharia, no, but to work within the madhab structures um, to, to, uh, to make it operative so that it's actually functioning. So. These are very important. One of the most important things and one of the dangers of the, 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 the new generation is that because they're growing up with video games and television and all these things, they're losing the ability to memorize. They're losing the ability to retain information. And our tradition is based on retention. The, the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put it in the fi sudur alladhina utul ilm. It's in the breasts of those, you know, Imam Shafi, ilmi ma'i haythu ma yamamtu. Right? I mean, my knowledge is with me wherever I go, right? Right? 
You know, if I, in, my, in my house, it's with me. If I'm in the marketplace, it's with me. That knowledge uh, has to be retained. So historically, this was very important. And, and, and we know that the best teachers in the West uh, that we have, that I've seen, are the ones that are retentive. Uh, but that's based on genius. So it's very important that we recognize that uh, the, the traditional way of learning is extremely important, but we have to upgrade it. It needs renovation, undeniably. And it needs to understand the age it's living in. Many of the books of fiqh uh, do not address the problems of modern commerce. Modern commerce is very complicated, and, and the ahkam al bayh wa shara in the traditional classical texts uh, do not deal with a lot of the problems of, of, of modern uh, finance. And, and a lot of modern finance is, is, would be clearly haram uh, in the past. But uh, even Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad Abdul Ghiyati, the kitab Imam al Juwaini says that, that if the, the ahkam get lost, then there is a qaida in, in, in the Islam that has to be retained, and that's tijara and taradhan, mm. that, that commerce has to be mutually, you don't cheat people, like the derivatives in, in, on Wall Street that cheated people of billions of dollars. You know, it's just plain and simple haram. So even the fuqah of the past recognized that things might become so complex, but you still have to have some basic moral principles in the, uh, in the tradition. Thank you. Thank you, Shay. And uh, there's something to, for us to pick up there. Don't throw the baby along with the bathwater and the kalam of our ulama is ma la yudraku kulhu, la yudraku kulhu. If you yeah. don't understand, you know, a bit of that thing, don't throw the whole thing. <laughs> so, mashallah, thank you for that wisdom indeed. Now, um, here's a question from, the, uh, um, from Facebook, apparently, from Qabil Azhari. I'm not quite sure he's from Azhar, but uh, here goes. Um, I'm currently doing an undergraduate degree in biomedical science in the UK, not in Oxford, but I can see why I chose this question. <laughs> Hence, my degree will eventually lead me to pursue a career as a researcher, in other words, a scientist. Now, as a researcher, I am bound to conduct experiments on living creatures, i.e. mice and cells. Inevitably, they will feel pain and they may eventually die as a result. But the initial purpose or intention of conducting the experiments on them is to help discover medical breakthroughs for the benefit of mankind. Does the intention justify this sacrifice or use of the living creatures? Will the animals and other living creatures seek justice from Allah on Yawm al Qiyamah? Will Tawbah be uh, accepted in that case? And what are your views, Sheikh, on the Muslims' understanding and indeed the Muslims' Any Muslims taking and undertaking courses such as mine, especially in a Western country? Uh, given that you're in, in England and you're a Mufti, I'm going to defer that question to you. <laughs> but I, uh, but, I, uh, yeah, but I, I would want, if you can actually, have, make a comment on, you know, uh, Muslims undertaking courses, especially in the you know, in a Western country here, the opposite of what's, what has actually happened vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, as, as far as fairs is concerned yeah. there. Um, well, I mean, the, you know, the, the West has knowledge that, that, that Muslims need. And these go under uh, Fara'id al-Kifaya, as you know. In Bab al-Jihad, which is where the ulama deal with uh, agriculture, engineering, medicine, this is all jihad. And uh, Ibn Rushd in, in, in the Muqaddimat, he said, Jihad yanqasimu ila arba'ati aqsam. There's four types of jihad. Jihadun bil qalb, jihadun bil lisan, jihadun bil yad, wa jihadun bil sayth. Military defense of the nation is only one out of uh, four. So it's only one fourth of jihad. The other ones, the qalb is the tazkiyah, struggling against yourself. In Surah Al Ankabut, which was revealed in Mecca before military jihad, Allah says, Those that do jihad for our sake, we will guide them. In other words, their, the thamra of their mujahada will lead to understanding and kashf and these things. They, they'll, they'll get a spiritual understanding of things. So that's jihad al-qalb. Jihad al-lisan is amr bin ma'roof and nahi an al-munkar and hisba, calling to good. Da'wah is part of jihad al-lisan because da'wah is actually part of jihad. People forget that. 
that calling people is jihad fi subilillah. So unfortunately, Muslims have relegated jihad to a military concept in an age when it's arguable that military jihad is completely unethical because the people that suffer from it are civilians, women and children. I'm opposed to modern violence because it's, it's, there's no nobility in it. There's no nothing. It's horrible. And, and I, I think Muslims should be against nuclear weapons. We don't want nuclear proliferation. I don't want to see all these countries. I want to see my own country disband their nuclear weapons. We need na international treaties. And they should stop this because لا يعذب بالنار إلا رب النار. No one can kill with fire except the Lord of Fire. And the poor people of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, no matter what the Japanese people did in World War II, and I know the Malays suffered at their hands, nobody deserves to be firebombed and have their civilians incinerated. I mean, it's just, it's evil. You know, so nuclear energy, to me, nuclear weapons are evil, and they're, they're against the whole concept of Islam. Um, on the other hand, I don't blame Iran for wanting to get nuclear power because Americans don't seem to bomb people with nu nuclear bombs. So I don't blame, I understand the mentality behind it. And I, if I was an Iranian leader, I would probably want to get nuclear weapons because if they look at their neighbors, the only ones the Americans haven't messed with are the ones that have the nuclear power. So I, I don't blame them, but I, it's not a good thing. You know, that's a problem. As for animals, I know the Prophet prohibited dissecting frogs. And that's a hadith sahih. You know, you know that. So uh, frogs are um, creatures that the Prophet loved because they, they do tasbih more than any of the other creatures. Um, so, but we know that uh, al-fadl, al-mafdul yakhdum al-fadl. I mean, there's qawaid in our uh, usul that, you know, if it's for the benefit of a higher order animal, um, then certain things are permissible. But generally, Muslims were very gentle with animals. They took great care of animals. They, they did not inflict suffering. The Prophet cursed those who took animals as, as an object of, uh, like, target practice. Um, that's obviously with no objective. And a man once came to him and said, uh, you know, I, I feel mercy to the sheep that I can't even s sacrifice it. He said, you feel that? And he said, yes. And he said, Allah will show mercy to you. So the Prophet ﷺ was very gentle with animals. Uh, in the Sahih collection, Aisha mentions there was a wild animal in the house that used to run around. And when the Prophet came, it would just suddenly become still and, and be out of respect for the Prophet ﷺ. And he loved animals. And one of the things about Muslims, they should have pets. It's very important for your children to have pets. Pets are very important in, in households. The Prophet ﷺ's household had many pets. They grew up with animals. It teaches children how to care for, for sentient creatures, and it will give them compassion. When you don't have pets, uh, people don't understand that animals are sentient. I mean, we just had, we, we went on a trip to uh, Turkey, and one of my boys stayed back, but the cat got depressed mm. because the boys oh, wow. weren't there to play with it. And, <laughs> And, it, and then when, it came, when they came home, they said it got really chirpy and happy again. So animals, in America, we, they put animals on Prozac. <laughs> you know, like do, a lot of depressed dogs in America. They're not depressed because they have some in, endogenous depression. They're depressed because of the families they're living in. You know, <laughs> that's the truth. Allah Mustan. Thank you. Thank you, Sheikh. Now, I may be... Uh, living in, in England, but in this land we have... We need scientists. Yeah. I'm not against science. And, mm. and Imam al-Ghazali, as you know, in Kitab al-Ilm, mm. he complains about the fuqaha. There's too many fuqaha and not enough scientists. Yes. He actually makes that complaint. Now, unfortunately, we have a lot of scientists and very few fuqaha. <laughs> so there's an argument that we need more fuqaha because the Prophet said you're living in a time where the orators are few but the fuqaha are many. And the time is coming when you'll have a lot of orators and few fuqaha. <laughs> and he also said وسلم, that you're living in a time where you don't have a lot of people that memorize the Quran but you guard the hudud of the Quran, the limits. In other words, you obey the Quran. But a time is coming when they will guard the limits letters of the Qur'an, they'll memorize it, but they won't obey the, the teachings of the Qur'an. 
So that's one of the signs of the, of the latter days. MashaAllah, MashaAllah. Thank you, thank you. Here's a question from uh, Tyra Sirin. Uh, she said that, um, Sheikh, you praise Malaysia for its love of Islam and education in your khutbah. Wow, Twitter and Facebook are quite fast, right? It's life. <laughs> um, my question is, what can we, Malaysian youth, do to incorporate Islamic values into our lives in order to be beneficial to ourselves, our society and the Ummah as a whole? How can we do Tawbah and still guard ourselves from getting carried away in hedonistic way of life? Uh, specifically too much gossip for example or music and entertainment? I think one, one of the most dangerous things now is the Western uh, influences um, and, and I would really uh, recommend that you brainwash your children uh, <laughs> as best you can. Brainwash meaning make sure their brains are clean because a lot of this um, this stuff is really filthy, the lyrics are filthy. Fakhruddin uh, al-Razi in the ayah which shaitan is threatened that if he istifsiz um, bisautika, you know that to uh, to incite them with your voice. Fakhruddin al-Razi in Mafatih al-Ghayb says by teaching them foul lyrics. Mm. And that's amazing that he said that, you know, in, mm. in, in, in centuries ago. Um, he's, he's 12th century. Oh, no. And so he's saying that shaitan would teach them foul lyrics. A lot of the rap music has foul lyrics and, and the, it's harmful, for the decibels for the, the ears also, it's very harmful to have high decibels. People are going deaf now. In the United States, we have loss of hearing at, at, in their 30s. Um, this is a new phenomenon. Television we know is harmful. It's a low-grade addiction according to studies in the United States. Um, watching a lot of television is harmful. We know that in the first trimester, a lot of on-time um, watching, on, on being on the computer, women that work on computers that are pregnant in the first trimester, it's actually dangerous to the fetus, which means an aborted fetus means that it wasn't viable. And the reason it wasn't viable is because of the electromagnetic uh, field. So you're in these fields that are, that are actually quite harmful. We're, we're a guinea pig generation. We don't know what a lot of this stuff is doing to our brains. But we do know, for instance, that attention deficit disorder is, is much more prevalent than it's ever been. Al autism is becoming one of the most widespread uh, illnesses in, in, in children. I mean, the autism, the numbers the, and the rates of autism are very terrifying. So a lot of this is the technology, much of the, I'm not a Luddite, I'm not anti-technology, but I think the technology has to be controlled. And that we have Facebook addiction, we have people that just can't get off the Facebook. Um, I call FB, I call it fitna book. In fact, in fact, uh, and, and Dr. Afifi knows uh, one of the greatest scholars in, in the history of uh, theology is, is a man, Abul Qasim al Samarqandi. Mm -hmm. He was the, the top student of Abu Mansur al Maturidi. Mm -hmm. Imam al Ghazali quotes him uh, in one of his Nasiha books where he says, Tansha'u al Fitnatu, Kull al Fitn, Tansha'u an Tharathati Nafar. All of Fitna come from three people. قائل الأخبار طارب استماع الأخبار ومتلقي الأخبار ولا يخلص أحدهم من الملامة Those newscasters, news seekers and news consumers All of tribulation in the world comes from those three And face, uh, the internet is basically people telling news people looking for news and people receiving news and this is why it's created so much fitna in the world because it's it's a source of fitna and people need to understand that this technology is new technology and we the prophet one of the signs he said he's uh, ibn mas'ud radiallahu he said uh, he asked if the the hour had signs and and the prophet said ya ibn mas'ud Inna li sa'ati asharata, the hour has signs. And then he said, وَمِنْ أَشَرَاطِهَا أَنْ تُوَاصَلَ الْأَطْبَاقِ وَتُقْطَعَ الْأَرْحَامِ He said that the atbaq would be continuous and the people would sever their kinship bonds. Now in the traditional tafsirs, they said it would mean they would eat one plate after another. 
When I read that hadith, it didn't convince me that that was the meaning. And I really believe that the meaning of that is muwasarat al in, in North Africa, they call the satellite dish tabaq, which is a correct ta'rib, because sahan is a flat dish. Tabaq is a curved dish, because it's made of tabaqat. And if you look at satellites, dishes, they have these tabaqat on them, atbaq. And the word in modern Arabic for satellite communications is muwasalat. So the very same word he used, that they will watch dishes. They will, to wasal al-atbaq, the dishes will be uh, continuous, their communication will be continuous. Min kulli hadabin yansilun. From every high place, the, they, the yajuj and majuj would come down. Mm. And hadab in Arabic means wave. Hadab al-mawj. In lisan al-Arab, it's one of the meanings of wave. And so we've got these waves of fitan, of pornography, of filth. Of, 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 of foulness, and Muslims are drinking these things up. And in the book of Fitan, the Prophet ﷺ said in Sahih Muslim, he said, تُعْرَضَ عَلَى الْقُلُوبِ in الْفِتْنَ سَتُعْرَضُ عَلَى الْقُلُوبِ كَالْحَصِيرِ That the, the, all of the fitan, seductive things, will be exposed to the hearts. And then he said, like hasir, like a, a matrix. And again, the early ulama, they didn't, they didn't understand what that meant. Because he says, udan, udan, horizontal and vertical lines. If you look at all the satellite dishes, they're matrices. They all have, they look just like hasir mats. mats. Oh, wow. oh. And, and now all these fitan are coming into the hearts. And the Prophet said that those hearts that drink it, they won't reject evil. Because you'll, your children are growing up accustomed to foulness. They'll think all of this is normal. Human beings have a fitra. The Prophet said, how will you be when you, when you ta'muruna bil munkar? Wa tunkirun al ma'roof. How will you be when you start commanding to evil and forbidding good? That this is what happens when people drink this stuff up. And the Prophet said that their hearts will become black and dark. And this is, you can see this, what kind of sick society would build games for children where you kill people to get rewards? What kind of a sick society? That's a society that thrives on war. That's a society that its number one business is armaments manufacturing. It's a society that wants to spread strife in the world. And, and our society is, we're called Darus Salam, the abode of peace. Allah calls to the abode of peace. And that's why we should really, the young people have to be, understand what's happening to them. They have to understand what these things really mean. They're wasting their, your time. Uh, Shaitan is the great time waster. He steals your time. And then before you know it, you're dead and your life is over and you, you're unprepared to go into the next dimension. Allah, 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 Allah. Um, now, this is a question from Shafiq Apandi, who I believe, I'm sure, Professor Hashim Kamali will like this question in particular. Some practical question for us in Malaysia. In these recent years, the issue of morality and freedom of expression in the country is growing in a very weird direction. We have cases like a couple walking out on the public street, nude, semi-nude, ooh, subhanAllah, in Malaysia. Uh, <clears throat> Muslim gays, right, I'm reading this by the way, Malays wanting to openly declare murtad, etc. How do we respond to this? I mean, what, is, what should be our take between freedom of expression and freedom of religion with the freedom to offend in Islam? <sighs> uh, first of all, I would say welcome to the modern world. Um, <laughs> You know, this, this is part, part of the world that we're in. Um, one of the things the Qur'an makes clear is that shaitan wants to denude us of our clothes and, and make us naked, civilized societies. You have aboriginal peoples here, and they're, 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 they're good people, they're very pure people. They, they live very simple societies, but even aboriginal peoples cover their nakedness. You don't see Aboriginal peoples uh, fully exposed in their nakedness. And orang asli, in case, yeah. Yeah, orang asli. asli yeah, problem. orang asli, orang hutang. Orang asal. <laughs> <laughs> but the Sheikh can speak Malay. <laughs> o o orang asli, the original man. They're Aboriginal, that's what it means, orang asli. 
So they are the original people, Allah. but they all they cover the so'atan. And you know in fiqh, the, the basic so'a is the, is the private part and, and the anus. Mm. That's, the, that's the foundation of awrah. And then what comes from that is what's called tahsinat. That we have hajat, we have darurat, hajat, and tahsinat. The tahsinat, this, these are what embellish life. And, and so you need clothes to protect you from cold, but you adorn. Every animal on this planet is adorned with clothes, either fur or hair. The only two that don't have clothes are pigs and, and, and humans. They have bashara. Bashar is the skin immediately is direct contact with the outside. And, but, and pigs, what do they do? They roll around in the mud to cover their nakedness. And humans, they wear clothes. So as societies become more uh, primitive, as they go back and revert to primitive behavior, they, they wear less and less clothes. This is what happens. The more civilized they are, the more clothes they put on. Because th it's, it's basic human decency, uh, and modesty, this is what the religions taught. Aboriginal peoples are, they live in tribal cultures that have very strong taboos that prevent them from fornicating with each other. And that's why, in, and that's why Margaret Mead, all of that crap she wrote in her book about, it was all made up stuff. And that's been proven. Aboriginal peoples do not, they, they rarely fall into fornication. They, they have taboos that are very strict in their societies. Um, they have a primitive fitrah that prevents them from doing this. That fornication, when you have societies where people begin to disrobe, you get uh, more and more of the sexual deviancy. This is, this is simply a fact of life. When you get sexual deviancy, you get venereal diseases. You get venereal diseases, you start getting birth defects, cervical cancers, oral cancers. And these diseases, many of them are not treatable. And this is simply a fact. HPV virus is not treatable. So you get HPV, the genital warts are a permanent uh, uh, effect of, of uh, sexual profligacy. The sharia is to protect you. There's nothing in the sharia that Allah gave us that isn't to protect you. It is there to protect us from our own selves. If we obey it, we're safe. If we disobey it, we expose ourselves to great harm. This is simply a fact. And any society that goes against these facts, you see the results of that society. So I would say in, the, in, in this culture, you're a modest culture. Haya is part of your tradition. Um, the orf is very important. Uh, people should be, don't let these things, because it, it, mm. it erodes quickly. You can take this away from people. Uh, I saw an interview with somebody who uh, was worked, uh, he was a CEO for Victoria's Secret, which is a lingerie company. It was in Time Magazine. And they asked him about opening up shops in China. And they said, but China is such a modest country. Do you think uh, lingerie will spread in China? And he said, well, America used to be a modest country. It's, it's nothing that a good ad campaign can't, uh, can't overcome. Mm. And this is their understanding. They know how humans are. As you get used to seeing things, the Arabs say, zabali ta'ud zubala that the, the, the man cleaning up the horse crap gets used to the stench of the horse crap. But when you go into the stable, you smell it, and you go, oh, what a horrible smell. And the stable boy just says, what smell? Because he's used to it. And this is what happens over time. People get used to these things. Your women are beautiful women. The, and, and they should be proud of the fact. Modesty is a beautiful quality, and it shouldn't be removed from people. Men also should be more modest. I, I, it really troubles me. I see these um, uh, Muslim families where the woman's dressed in black and she's got her hijab, sometimes a niqab, and then the man next to her has a t-shirt, I'm with stupid, and he's wearing shorts, you know. And, and I'm just looking at this person saying, what, what a contradiction. Why, you're, you're, you're making your wife dress in traditional clothes and you look like some kid that 10-year-old kid at Disneyland. If you, if you look, at, if you look at, at children in old pictures, just look at old pictures from, from uh, the Renaissance period. Children were dressed like little adults. They never had children's clothes. That's a modern invention. Children, in your culture, Malay culture, children always wore the sarang. They dressed traditional, and they still do it on the Eids and, and thing. They put nice adult sarong. clothes on. Exactly. But now these shorts... We have now 50-year-olds that look like they're six years old. 
<laughs> and, and this is the loss of human dignity. We need to restore human dignity. We're, we're Beno Adam. We were created in, in the metaphysical image. We're a high thing. We're not a low thing. We're meant to walk with dignity. Muslims, wherever they were, they wore beautiful, dignified clothes. They weren't buffoons. They didn't look like uh, idiots. We, now we have a jackass culture where people do stupid things to get on TV. We, we should be higher than that. We're something amazing. Humans are amazing. I, I seriously, uh, the, the people that I sat with in, in, the, in the Mauritanian desert, Bedouin people, with so much dignity, they had so much human dignity. Aboriginal people, untouched by this modern syphilitic civilization. Really. And this is, the Malay people, you have so many good things, preserve them. Hafidhu alayha. Preserve these things. Don't lose them because when you lose them, they're forgotten. Your children and grandchildren won't know they're gone. I remember a time we didn't have cell phones. I miss that time. Now people think they can't live without cell phones. If you tell these children, give up your cell phone, they can't do it. But we lived without cell phones. We lived without computers. Really, my mother grew up without television. These things are new things. Humans, they, they entertain themselves for centuries without need of these things. We had storytellers much more beautiful than watching these empty stories that completely, uh, they, 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 they degrade us. You know, a young woman, it used to be when she got married, she heard things from her husband that she'd never heard before. Now she's heard them a million times from films and movies. <laughs> They're just lines that don't mean anything. <laughs> you know, but it used to be when you said, I love you, it meant something. Now they've heard that a million times by actors. You know the Greek word for actor? Hippocrates, hypocrite. <laughs> actors are hypocrites. They're just pretending. It's not real. Life is real. We need to get back to these real things, to, to human fellowship and companionship, intelligent conversation. People have forgotten these things. MashaAllah, MashaAllah, thank you. And the thing we can take from that is, you know, Man Ahmad, who is really the stupid one here, in fact. Thank you, thank you, Sheikh. And the final question now for the evening. Uh, this is from Muhammad Izwan, and indeed I believe this question will be, uh, in fact, uh, you know, quite important and close to the hearts of many people here, not least uh, the government here, the law enforcement agencies, um, and so on and so forth. Um, dear Sheikh, uh, in my view, global tawbah means returning to the Islamic way of life in a global scale. It also means, perhaps, to return to the golden age of Islam, whereas the Islamic Caliphate are still in power in the world. With the abolishment of the Caliphate in 1924, however, the world has been in an absence of the Caliphate for about 90 years or so since the establishment of it by the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Now. Um, before Hijra, Prophet Muhammad ﷺ had faced a society that had no, that, that was really, in, his, in, in my view, no different from the society in which we live today. Therefore, in my view, the, the global tawba or the restoration of Islamic Caliphate, I really think must start with the approach of the Prophet when he was uh, in Mecca. So could the failure to understand the movement to restore the caliphate without understanding the approach that our prophet used in Makkah have led to the failure to restore the caliphate today? What is your opinion on the movement to restore the Islamic caliphate that is happening today in Syria and Iraq, known for example in this country as ISIL or ISIS or now sometimes just known as IS? Um, what is your view on this, uh, particularly with regards to the killing of uh, innocent people? And is it true that the Islamic Caliphate can only be restored with the emergence of Imam Mahdi in Mecca, since every Islamic Caliphate in, in history had, had access to the Hijaz? <clears throat> Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Well, first of all, uh, in, in a text that was taught, the Imamah is in Aqidah traditionally, that's where they deal with it. If you read the books of Aqidah, they usually deal with Imamah. It's one of the furu' of Aqidah. Um, and Imam al tusi has an extensive bahath on it. Um, Imam Tiramsani, uh, Ibn uh, Zakri, 
great scholar from Fez has a very nice um, bahath uh, research on that. Uh, Ibrahim al-Laqani, the great uh, Maliki scholar from al-Azhar, whose text was taught for the last 400 and some odd years in, uh, in the Middle East, in sure. al-Azhar in particular, he says, وَوَاجِبُ نَصْبُ إِمَامَ الْعَدْرِ بِالشَّرْعِ فَعْلَمْ لَا بِحُكْمَ الْعَقْلِ وَلَيْسَ رُكْنًا يُعْتَقَدْ فِي الدِّينِ فَلَا تُزِيغْ عَنْ أَمْرِهِ الْمُبِينِ He says that to have a, an imam, meaning a ruler, that's traditionally what the, the ruler was called. He was called imam, because he's the leader. He said, and, ha, and it's an obligation to have an imam. And, and then he says, by the sharia, not by the aql. In other words, it's a, it's a, a divine injunction and not a rational principle because the Mu'tazilite disagreed they, they said it wasn't from Sharia it was a hukum aqli so he said it's not a, a rational judgment it's actually from the Sharia but he said but it is not a rukun of the religion it's not a pillar of the religion so don't go against the imam who you have whoever's your ruler because the prophet in his bay'ah he said la tunazi' al amri fil amri don't don't go against the people put over you Obey Allah and obey the Messenger and obey those put over you. Now, can there be more than one Imam at any one time? That was an ikhtilaf issue. And the ulama differed. And they said uh, that there could be if the lands were far apart. Uh, the, 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 the khilafah never ended in Morocco. There, there's been an unbroken chain for the last over 400 years. Um, and the king has always been known there as Amir al-Mu'mineen. He's a Qurayshi Hashemaith, and they've always had that. They were not part of the Ottoman Empire. Mm. So the Moroccans have maintained their bay'ah with their king. Now, the democratic uh, uh, movement, the revolutionary movements that came into the Muslim world overthrew a lot of the kings. Uh, in Libya, they used to shout in the streets, Iblis wala Idris. Give us Iblis and not King Idris. And King Idris, who was a very righteous man, they got rid of him and then Iblis came. And they had him for 40 years and now they have Jahannam. <laughs> no, <laughs> you know, so, <laughs> If you try to hasten something before it's time, then the Qaida Fiqhiyah says that you, get, you, you, you don't get the thing, you're deprived of it. Like a, somebody who kills their father, they don't inherit the money. They get the had punishment. So it's important to note that Islam does not need a khilafah. And that's, a, that's agreed upon, mujma' alayh. And the proof of it is the hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari of Hudayfa. كَانَ النَّاسِ يَسَرُونَ عَنَ الْخَيْرِ فَكُنْتُ أَسْهُوَ عَنِ الشَّرْمَ مُخَافَةً يُدْرِكَنِي People were asking about good, so I asked about evil. Out of fear, I would see it. And at the end of the hadith, Hudayfa says, what should I do? When, because he talks about there'd be these horrible people calling to hellfire, claiming to be from the Prophet. Du'atun ara abu abn nar. Whoever answers them will get thrust into the hellfire. And these are these people now. And the Prophet Hudayfa said, What do I do? He said, Ilzam jama'at al Muslimin wa imamahum. Cling to the, the group and the imam. And he, Hudayfa was a genius. He said, Wa in lam yakun lahum. Imam. What if there's no group and no imam? And he said, Then avoid all the sex and just be on your own. He didn't say, No, you have to establish the khilafah. It's a fart kifaya, and if nobody's doing it, you have to do it. And that's in Sahir Bukhari. So don't be deluded by these people. You have good uh, governance here. There's problems. I'm not stupid. <laughs> you know, seriously, there's always going to be problems. Any government is going to have problems. But relative to other places, you have good governance. Trust me, I've been all over the world. You have good governance. There, there needs to be more transparency. There needs to be all these things. That's true. And, and inshallah, كيف ما تكون يوالى عليكم. The more transparent you are, the more transparent Allah will make your rulers. So you need to rectify yourselves. But your rulers here, you have to obey them uh, unless they command you to ma'asiyah. That's the only time. And I am very traditional in this area because you see what revolutions do. 
Look at the result of revolutions. And this is why our ulama for centuries have been against revolutions. And that was before bombs, before uh, MiG jets, before F-16s, before uh, missiles. They were against it because of bloodshed. What do the angels say when they say, أَتَجَعْرُ fiha? مَنْ يُفْسِدُ fiha? وَيُسْفِكُ الدِّمَا Are you going to put in the earth those who corrupt and shed blood? And in the hadith, in the ayah about Habil and Qabil, Cain and Abel, when, when he raises his hand, he said, مَا أَنَا بِبَاسِطٍ يَدَيَّ إِلَيْكَ لِيَقْتُرَكَ I'm not going to raise my hand to kill you. إِنِّي أَخَافُ اللَّهَ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ I fear Allah. In the tafsirs, they say, Mujahid, who was one of the great students of Ibn Abbas, Tarjuman al-Quran, he says the first sharia was non-violence. It was prohibited to kill if somebody was going to kill you. Which means the foundation of human existence is non-violence. Mm -hmm. That it is a rukhsa to defend yourself. And in fact, Ibn Omar said it is permitted to let somebody kill you like Uthman, who could have defended himself, but he chose not to. Because he was following the hadith of the Prophet, if you can be the, the, the Abdullah being killed, rather than the Abdullah killing, then be that. And that's why he's a shaheed, he has that maqam. So this spreading of violence around this globe is a demonic thing. It's from Iblis because he hates us. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, abtalana bi iblis, but we know the tricks of iblis. Qad ya'isa iblisu as shaytanu an yu'bada fi jazirat al-Arab, walakinna tahrisha baynakum. He has despaired of being worshipped by Muslims, but he is content with showing, sowing dissension amongst you. Fa iyakum wa iyahu. Watch out, and watch out from him. The Egyptians have a nice saying, khalli barik min nafsik. You know, Take care of yourself. But if you translate it literally, it means empty your mind of your ego. <laughs> There's too much ego. Nafsi, nafsi. This is shaitan. Nafsi. Now everybody's taking selfies. Narcissistic people. You know, in the Emirates, in the Emirates, they've had several mortal fatalities, accident, car accidents from people taking selfies. They kill themselves driving. We had it in America. People taking selfies. One girl was listening to the happy song. You know this stupid song about happy like a house without a roof. I mean, who the hell is going to be happy if they have a house without a roof? And, and so they're listening to this song and she tweets to her friend, Oh, I'm so happy listening to the happy song. And she goes into the other lane and has a head-on collision. That was the last thing she tweeted. Happy listening to the happy song. Now where is she? Not so happy. <laughs> you know, seriously. I mean, all these f cameras. I'm so sick of cameras. <laughs> I, really, I've ne I don't, my wife's here and she knows. I don't take pictures. This is my camera. I can see all of you. If I close my eyes, I see my teachers. Mm. Wallahi, I see them in my heart. I don't need a camera. I never take picture. People say, can I take a picture? I don't want, take a picture right here. Just be here. Be present. <laughs> don't, don't think about tomorrow. You might not see tomorrow. Be present. This camera is destroying us. Really, all these stupid selfies. You know, I'm people putting, oh, I had, I had, uh, I had uh, spinach and quiche for lunch, look, and put it online and show everybody what you had for lunch. Next, why don't you take what, what goes into the toilet? Why don't you take the picture there and show them, oh look, it came out the other end. You know, seriously, what, what, are, what happened to us? Allah. What's happened to us? So now I'm giving ideas, now they'll start doing that, right? Yeah. Something new. <laughs> <laughs> Not the ishtihad of Shi Hamza here. <laughs> Thank you, mashallah. Well, Shi, <laughs> mashallah. <laughs> Allah, Allah mustan. Well, indeed, that was a very important question because um, uh, indeed it, it's quite sad and very shameful really for us, for Malaysians, when we found out that a number of our own people actually had ended up being, for example, in Iraq and, and Syria who had participated in, in that. Yes, which is, which is why it, it's a, it's a it's great shock. And you know, look, some of these people, I'm not going to deny their sincerity. There's people, they, they, they're zealous, they, they want uh, good for Islam, mm. that's true. But ikhlas is not enough. Absolutely. You can't be mukhlis. Ibn Qayyim al jawziyyah says there, there's mukhlisun in other religions. Mm. You have to be mukhlis with, with huda, with guidance. And that's called mukhlas. Mm. There's mukhlisun in the Quran and mukhlasun. Mm. 
The Allah has the two words. One is the passive, where they have tawfiq from Allah, and the other is the active. And you need both. Uh, and so, really, you're, and look, the pro, you ha, jihad is prohibited without your parents' permission. It's prohibited. And, and if they go without, and you need to teach your children that. that and the Prophet, a, man came, a young man came to the Prophet asking permission to go on a military expedition. He said, are your parents alive? And he said, yes. He said, fafihima fajahid. Do jihad taking care of your parents. Go build a hospital. Become a doctor. Heal people. Go serve the, the, the orang asli. Hmm. Go, go help the orang. The Christians are going and converting them. Because nobody has, nobody's going and serving them. Go serve them. Take care of them. They're nice people. Hmm. Hmm. Really. Go protect the orangutan. Uh. You know, they're endangered species. <laughs> they'll, 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 really, they'll testify for you on Yom Qiyamah. You know? uh, <laughs> because these poor animals, what did they do to deserve us? They're just being animals, but we're not being humans. What did they do to deserve us? Allah. Wallahi, what did the fish do to deserve us? Allah. Allah. The Prophet said in a hadith, al mustarihu wal mustarahu minhu, mm. in Sahih Bukhari, he said, the one who has rest and the one who others have rest from him. And they asked him, who are those, Ya Rasulullah? And he said, al mustarihu astaraha min nasib al-dunya ila rahmatillah. The, 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 mustari, the mustarih is the one who he dies and he's done with the fatigue of this world to the mercy of God. Allah. Like a righteous person. He said al-mu'min uh, who goes to the... And then he said that the mustarahu minu was al-abd al-fajir. Al-ladhi idha mat yastarihu minhu al-ibad wal-bilad wal-shajar wal-dawab or kama qal. When he dies, the bad person, when he dies, the servants get repose from him. The lands get repose from him. Trees, oceans, rivers. The animals get repose from him. The Prophet said the animals get repose from him. You know, so we want to be the mustarih, not the mustarahu minhum. We want to be the one who gets repose when we leave this world, not the one that the world gets repose from us because we're gone and stop doing our fasad. Jazakumullah mm. khairan. Wallahi, um, saya sayang kamu semua. Saya sayang semua. What he said. Wahibbukum. <laughs> Jazakumullah khairan. May Allah bless all of you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect your land. May Allah protect your land. May He protect the, 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 all the people of this land. You know, I want to say, I'll finish with one thing. Islam, the great genius of our religion, and, and, and one of the great truths of our Prophet is that he came as a mercy to everyone. Mm. And, and this is why he created multi-ethnic, multicultural societies. He had all types of people. He had Persians, he had Romans, he had Africans, he had Arabs, he had all the different Arab tribes, and he brought them into a, a fraternity of Rahmah. And, and, and he had Jews and Christians, and he honored them and treated them. When the Jews of, the Christians of Najran came, he honored them in his mosque. He spoke to them kindly. Allah said, وَجَادِرُهُمْ بِالَّتِيهِ أَحْسَنْ Speak to them in a beautiful way. He was not a harsh person. He was a gentle person. But he, he created an open society. Obviously with limits, because we have uh, akhlaq. But one of the great beauties of this place is that you have Chinese people, yes. you have Indian people, you have Malay people, you have Orang Asri, all these mm. different people mm. living together mm. and, 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 and you're all part of this beautiful culture Amen. of Malaysia. May Allah keep that here Amen. and preserve in you the tolerance of Islam. Our religion is a tolerant religion. It honors other people. It treats them with dignity as human beings. We have ennobled and dignified all of the children of Adam. If they're in an Adamic form, they have the dignity of Bani Adam. And so they should be honored just for that dignity. And every, uh, every person is a potential believer. And so leave the door open for everybody. We welcome people. Marhaban. What Come in. Come. Like, like Mawlana Rumi said, I just came from Qunya. He said, Come again, come again, a thousand times come again. Mm. Idolater, Hindu, Christian, mm. Buddhist, Muslim, 
come again. If you've broken your vow a thousand times, come again. Ours is not a caravan of despair. You know, come again. Just come back to Allah. Make tawbah to Allah. Tubu it Allah. Our Lord has a door that's always open. It's the door of tawbah. The, the people in disbelief make a tawbah from their shirk or their ilhad. The people of belief make a tawbah if they're from Ahl al-Kaba'ir, from the Kaba'ir. If they're from Ahl al-Saga'ir, from the Saga'ir, from the lesser sins. If they're from the people of righteousness, from their extravagance. If they're from the highest people, from any heedlessness that occurred to their minds. Tawbah is always open. May Allah make us people of Tawbah. May He bless your community. May He bless your, your rulers, your ministers, the, the postal workers, all of the people that are keeping your streets clean. May He bless all the people. May He protect the people on the roads. Inshallah, may He alleviate your traffic problem. I hope that happens. Jazakumullah khairan. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. The, the Sheikh, Alhamdulillah, has come at the right time for a Malaysian lover here. This is an auspicious time, of course, for your arrival here because um, we'll be having our Independence Day in the, this, this Sunday. And um, I'd like to ask yeah. formally now, uh, Sheikh, to just recite a prayer for, for our country um, to uh, remember amongst the things that you spoke yeah. about earlier. The people, uh, for example, who um, had been lost in Iraq and Syria to have Tawbah, to remember also the victims of the uh, Malaysian Airlines MH17 and yeah. indeed the MH370 oh, wow. as well. And of course, um, you know, this Gaza. is people of Gaza. And uh, we, we ask you uh, to, to do a, a formal prayer for us. This is in accordance with our tradition here that we normally end our majlises like this with the ulama. <laughs> The uh, independence is, the real independence is when we're freed of our nafs. Mm. You know, um, when I was a young man, um, I, before I was Muslim, I, I liked a Jamaican singer called Bob Marley. Mm. Uh, and, and Bob Marley, he said, uh, free yourselves from mental slavery. Mm. None but ourselves can free our mind. Have no fear of atomic energy. Because none of them can stop the time. Amen. So we need uh, independence of the mind. You have uh, political freedom, inshallah. Um, may Allah free our minds from all of this uh, demonic uh, music and demonic entertainment and all these dark things that are pulling humans down and making them forget themselves. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allahumma salli wa sallam wa baraka ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam tasliman. Allahumma aqsim lana min khashitika ma tahulu bihi baynana wa bayna ma'asik wa min ta'atika ma tubalagu bihi jannatik wa min al-yaqini ma tahawinu bihi alayna masaib al-dunya wa matta'na bi asma'ina wa abasarina wa quwatina abda ma'ahyaytana wa ja'al tha'arana ala man dharamana wa ansurna ala man adana wa la taj'al musibatana fi dinina Allahumma la taj'al musibatana fi ديننا اللهم لا تجعل النار لا تجعل الدنيا غاية رغبتنا ولا إلى النار مصيرنا ولا تصلت علينا بذنوبنا من لا يرحمنا ولا يخاف فينا اللهم يا الله اللهم اجعل هذا البلد بلدا آمنا مؤمنا مأمونا اللهم اجعل أهلها من الآمنين يا الله اللهم اجعل السلام بينهم اللهم ألف بين قلوبهم اللهم فرحهم في الدنيا والآخرة اللهم اجعلهم فرحين في الدنيا والآخرة اللهم بارك في أرزاقهم وفي أقواتهم وفي منازلهم وفي أولادهم اللهم اجعل الحشمة في قلوب نسائهم اللهم اجعل الحياة في قلوب رجالهم وأولادهم اللهم وفق ولاة أمورهم اللهم وفق ولاة أمورهم يا رحم الرحمين اللهم أرشدهم رشدا اللهم لا تجعلهم لا تجعل لهم بطانة سوء اللهم اجعلهم بطانة خير يرشدهم إلى التقوى وإلى ما تحب وترضى اللهم وفقهم لما تحب وترضى أنت أرحم الرحمين نتوب إليك اللهم نستغفرك ونتوب إليك يا الله اللهم أرحمنا أنت أرحم الرحمين واغفر لنا وارحمنا وتب علينا إنك أنت تواب رحيم اللهم إنك عفو كريم تحب العفو يا كريم فعفو عنا يا الله اللهم عفو عنا سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين آمين تقبل الله منكم
Alhamdulillah, Jazakumullahu Khairan Kathira. Thank you very much, Honorable Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, for your dua. We certainly are very blessed to have you here with us in Malaysia, Sheikh. May Allah bless you always, and we certainly hope that you will continue to visit us more frequently. Our sincere thanks also goes to our distinguished guest, Yang Berhormat Datuk Sri Shahidan Kasim, Minister in the Prime Minister's Department.